Maxwell's equations in Fourier space. This can be a confusing topic if you're new to it. So I want to start off just by talking about what Fourier space is and trying to visualize that for you. We'll then move on to the complex series and we need to modify that a little bit to do expansions that incorporate our reciprocal lattice vectors because we want to do our expansions in the direction of those reciprocal lattice vectors. We'll then go on, we'll write Maxwell's equations in Fourier space. In fact, we'll step from real space to Fourier space, and then in the end, visualize the plane wave expansion that we end with. What is Fourier space? So we will start with Maxwell's equations, the differential time domain form, and there's two ways that we can apply a Fourier transform to these. Most often, when we apply a Fourier transform, we're Fourier transforming time to frequency. And when we do that, we end up with Maxwell's equations in the frequency domain. And what we can see is that our time derivatives are gone. We now have j and omega. Well, instead, what if we applied our Fourier transform instead of to time to our spatial coordinates x, y, z? When we do that, we end up in what we call Fourier space. And our spatial derivatives are now gone. And in its place, we're doing a cross product with our wave vector. So Fourier space and frequency domain, yes, they both take Fourier transforms to get there, but they're very different concepts that we can apply in different combinations. We could have a time domain Fourier space or a frequency domain Fourier space. And methods utilize all four of these different combinations. A great one for time domain real space is finite difference time domain. There's also something called discontinuous Galerkin and other methods that I'm not even mentioning here. Time domain Fourier space, it's really a twist on finite difference time domain called pseudo spectral finite difference time domain. And what we're doing is Fourier transforming finite difference time domain to do the spatial derivatives in this Fourier space and constantly bouncing back and forth. We can have frequency domain real space. That's finite element, our finite difference frequency domain. A lot of numerical methods fall here. And we can have frequency domain Fourier space. We're leading up to plane wave expansion method, rigorous coupled wave analysis, but there are other methods like spectral domain, slice absorption method, and others. So what is Fourier space? Well, we're very used to real space where we have the field stored in some kind of three-dimensional array for a three-dimensional problem. We're showing that here. And we divide space up into cells and we will store the value of the electromagnetic field at each point or inside each one of those cells. So we know it at discrete points. And we can plot that and see sort of pixelated pictures of our fields. We're very used to that. And that's how we can visualize real space, X, Y, Z. What about Fourier space? This is very difficult to visualize. Instead of knowing the field at discrete points, we're going to know amplitudes of plane waves, all at different angles. So what I'm showing here on the lower right is a set of plane waves, all at different angles. Now these are plane waves of infinite extent. They're all overlapping, but can't really draw that so i've just drawn them as an array and separate but they are overlapping and so we would store the amplitude associated with each one of those but that amplitude since it's associated with a plane wave doesn't have a spatial coordinate it exists everywhere that plane wave exists everywhere so real space we know the field at discrete points in Fourier space we know the amplitudes of a bunch of different plane waves and that plane wave expansion will turn out, will come from our Fourier series expansion. Here is an equivalent, yet a slightly different way to visualize these spatial harmonics. And what I'm showing is little cubes, and I'm showing essentially that plane wave in each one of those cubes. Now, in reality, we'd have to bring all of these cubes together and add them all up to get the overall field because our field is the sum of all of those plane waves, but I have to show them separate just to, to see all of them. 
So this is another an equivalent way to visualize what Fourier space looks like. Just remember, we're storing amplitudes of plane waves. Let's review the complex Fourier series and put that in terms of our reciprocal lattice vectors. First, I'll present the equations for the conventional complex Fourier series that you probably learned in calculus or wherever else. And maybe you've only seen the one dimensional complex Fourier series, but we are essentially expanding our function into a bunch of complex exponentials. So of course this is trig functions, sines and cosines. We're decomposing our original function f of x and writing it as a bunch of sines and cosines. And each one of those sines and cosines has a complex amplitude associated with it. So the magic is how do we determine the amplitudes of these complex exponentials? And here we have this integral. So that you may have seen. It turns out we can have a two-dimensional complex Fourier series. And it's a simple extension of the one-dimensional complex Fourier series. And of course, there's a three-dimensional complex Fourier series, and a four, and a five, and a six, and it would never end. I've never gone past three dimensions because we live in a three-dimensional world, but mathematically, that's absolutely possible. Let's write these again, but now in terms of reciprocal lattice vectors. So from the previous slide, if I simply let my 2 pi over lambda, that would be the period of my periodic structure, let that equal t, and we can recognize that as a magnitude of a reciprocal lattice vector, it lets us write our one-dimensional complex Fourier series in terms of that reciprocal lattice vector. So that makes a little bit more sense now when we bring this into two dimensions. Now we'll have a T1 and a T2 with integer indices P and Q multiplying these. Now what's different about two dimensions, this T1 and T2, they don't have to be perpendicular to each other. We can talk about oblique symmetries like hexagonal, where the T1 and T2 are not at 90 degrees with respect to each other. And of course, we can also write this in three dimensions. So that's the generalized complex Fourier series written about our reciprocal lattice vectors. And I'll throw out that it is always most efficient to do your expansions in the direction of the reciprocal lattice vectors. Maybe somebody smart enough can come up with an exception somewhere where that's not true, but that is my thinking right now. Just to remind you for lattice symmetries where the reciprocal lattice vectors are all perpendicular, our T1, T2, and T3 would reduce to something like this. And the math appears to simplify considerably but in fact, in the code, it really doesn't cost much to just stick with ordinary reciprocal lattice vectors that we can have in any direction. Finally, Maxwell's equations in Fourier space. So here's where we'll start. And this is not pure Maxwell's equations. We've done a few things here. We've normalized the magnetic field and we normalize it according to the equation that we're showing at the bottom, this mu over epsilon squared of mu over epsilon, that's what's bringing E and H to be the same order of magnitude. And I include this negative J for selfish reasons, so that in Maxwell's curl equations, there's no J and all of them are positive on the right-hand side. Otherwise, one set of equations would have a negative sign, the other wouldn't, and I can never remember where that thing goes. So I normalize this way and it works out really nice for me. This is where we'll start. So we're going to assume that we have a wave inside of a periodic medium. Well, if the medium is periodic, then we can expand the permittivity and the permeability into a complex Fourier series. And we're doing this with the Fourier series along the directions of our reciprocal lattice vectors, T1, T2, and T3. So, once we've calculated our Fourier coefficients, A and B, essentially all of the information of our permittivity and permeability is in A and B. We really don't need the actual permittivity or permeability anymore. All the information is contained in those Fourier coefficients, A and B.
Now the field we expand slightly differently. Remember the field in a periodic structure has to satisfy Bloch's theorem. That means it's written as the product of two things. It's written as the as a plane wave term and it's written as a periodic envelope term. And it's this periodic envelope term that we have expanded into our complex Fourier series, but our complex Fourier series in the direction of the reciprocal lattice vectors. And so for right now, we can kind of think of this beta as our incident wave vector, but that analogy does not go too far because we're talking about an infinite plane wave inside of an infinitely periodic medium. There really wasn't an incident wave that caused all this. We're just kind of asking a question, what on earth kind of waves would do this? The wave is already there. So that analogy only goes so far. The first thing we'll do is we'll bring this exponential into the triple summation and just move the beta up here with our reciprocal lattice vectors. At this point, we have something dot r. Well, to make this look like a plane wave, let's call this expression inside parentheses k, a wave vector with indices p, q, and r. So this is the wave vector for each of the plane waves in our expansion that we're defining right now. So we end up here, and this is clearly a set of plane waves because this is a infinite plane wave here, and the S is its complex amplitude. And of course, it's a vector quantity because each of those plane waves can have a polarization. So very often we'll call this a plane wave expansion because we've expanded our periodic field into a set of plane waves. So here's the, the final way that we'll write it. And notice I've expanded the dot product down here. Also notice how I'm writing this. I'm writing kx and then in parentheses pqr. That's really to remind us that this is a three-dimensional array of numbers, both for kx, ky, kz, and also s. In fact, we have an sx, an sy, an sz, so we have a lot of 3D arrays going on. But if we do want to look at this in terms of the x, y, z components, I've written that out here and how we would do our expansions for x, y, and z. So we'll start and grab one of the equations from Maxwell's curl equations, and here we are. We now have a bunch of stuff that we can expand into our complex Fourier series. Well, we know what the hz will look like, and this is the form where we brought beta into the summation, combined it with the exponential, and then written what's up here as the dot product of a k dot r. So we can do that for hz. We can do that for hy as well. Our permittivity is periodic. It's expanded into a complex Fourier series, but we're sticking with the, just the reciprocal lattice vectors here. There was no beta to bring in here because this is not a wave. It's just a periodic medium. And the electric field is our last periodic field. This did have a beta, so notice we're writing it with the wave vector in here instead of the reciprocal lattice vectors. They're still reciprocal lattice vectors. They've just been absorbed into our wave vector components. So we have a whole bunch of triple summations that we're going to substitute into this equation. And we end up here. Wow, that's a big, ugly equation. And we even have the product of two triple summations. So we have some work to do. We have a bunch of ugly terms. We have this first ugly term that we'll think about. We have the second ugly term that we have to think about. And then we have this third ugly term where it's the product of two triple summations. So here's the first ugly term. We want to bring this derivative inside the summation. When we do that, this uz, this is a constant. It's not a function of y, so it comes to outside the derivative operator. So now we just have this derivative operating on a complex exponential, and that's pretty easy to do. It's the exponential over again, but we take this y functionality here. There's also a minus j, and we bring a minus j k y to the outside. And so we'll just simplify this a little bit. I'll take this minus jky, bring it over here. And that's our first ugly term. Our second ugly term, it's really the same thing. We're bringing this z derivative in. It's operating on just the exponential. We end up bringing a minus jkz to the outside. And I just write that here. 
So that's our second ugly term. Almost identical things, just one was a JKY that we brought out and the other was a JKZ. Now on to this product of two triple summations. If we stare at this long enough, we will recognize this is actually called a Cauchy product. And we handle it this way. We write it instead of the product of two summations, we write it as a summation of another summation. So it's a double summation. A product of two single summations becomes a single double summation. So that's how we write it. We have a triple summation inside another triple summation. It's a triple summation Cauchy product, if you will. So here's where we were right after we did our substitutions. We handled each three of these ugly terms separately and we end up here. What a big, ugly equation that is. What on earth could we do with that? And I do promise this simplifies down considerably. The first thing we'll notice is each term here is inside of the same triple summation. So I'm going to bring that triple summation to the outside. And here's the rest of the equation left to the inside. Now, this equation on the inside is really written once for every combination of PQR. So this is a repeat from the previous slide. We're just going to take what's on the inside here and we end up with this equation. We don't need that outside triple summation. We'll just remember this equation we have to write for every possible combination of P, Q, and R. Now each of these terms as a complex exponential sitting here. So we can divide this whole thing by that same complex exponential and we end up here. And this really is the final form of our equation in Fourier space. No more spatial derivatives. We have our wave vector components. We could have done this another way. So we start here. What if we had just said, we're going to Fourier transform this equation with our spatial coordinates. Well, we could just write this directly. Now in real space, this permittivity times the electric field, that is a point by point multiplication. And one thing we know about Fourier transforms, point by point multiplications in one domain becomes a convolution in the other domain. So when we Fourier transform the spatial coordinates, this spatial point by point multiplication becomes a convolution. So that tells us what that product of two triple summations and all that craziness really is. That is a convolution. It's a three-dimensional convolution in Fourier space. So that's the big aha here. So this remaining triple summation in our equation in Fourier space, and we were thinking to ourselves, what the heck is that? That is a convolution happening. So we did this for our first equation. And it's very similar work for the other five equations. And we end up with our two sets of equations here. This is Maxwell's equations in Fourier space. And I'm reminding us in the middle here how we have expanded the fields. So we had this beta and we also had our reciprocal lattice vectors. So one neat thing to do, we had our six expanded equations. They were all scalar equations. It's actually possible to bring these back to a vector form of Maxwell's equations in Fourier space. So we'll take our first group of equations. And if we stare at that long enough, what we realize is it's actually our wave vector doing a cross product with this U. And then of course, our epsilon is being convolved with S. S is the amplitudes of the electric field component of our spatial harmonics. Our second set of equations looks almost exactly the same. Let's think more about visualizing this plane wave expansion. So this is how we have been visualizing our plane wave expansion, and this has limitations. Our imaginations only go so far. Each of those plane waves, I'm drawing them little and I'm drawing them separate. 
but in fact, they all exist really at the same point. They don't exist at a point. They're infinitely large. They're all over the place. Now, if I try to draw that, that's the mess we end up with. We can't see what's going on here. So I am forced to separate these simply so that we can see all of them. But this one at the lower left, this physically is what's happening. All of the waves exist simultaneously and they're all overlapping, but that's a big mess and we can't really understand that. So I like writing them expanded in this way and, and keep in mind these really are plane waves of infinite extent. So if we take cubic symmetry and we do an expansion, so this looks like a five by five by five expansion. This is really how we have been looking. And we've really been setting beta equal to zero when we expand this way. Well, what if beta is not zero? Let's just pick a bunch of other directions and look at what the expansions happen. So the beta seems to favor the expansion in that direction a little bit. But these are all correct expansions. We have to account for beta. So let's let beta equal zero. And let's look at what these expansions look like for different lattice symmetries. So now we know we've been looking at an expansion for a simple cubic lattice. Well, we can expand using the reciprocal lattice vectors for face center cubic or hexagonal or square or triangular, square and triangular for two dimensional lattices. And so we see that this is where our expansions are not happening along the standard Cartesian coordinates and it is hugely more efficient to analyze a periodic structure in its natural coordinate system, which is the reciprocal lattice vectors. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.